Happy Friday to you. And this is my time of the year. You will have a full plate of football. Well, you got a little bit of it last night. We'll talk a little bit. By the way, interesting watching the Patriots, the Eagles' first opponent in week one. I'm going to give you my assessment a little bit on them here in a second. I do think you're going to have issues with them, and I'm going to explain why. But you're going to have a full plate tonight. All the games will hit on them a little bit. Some of the teams that are going to be going into the 2023 season with question marks. Some teams that I think are going to get better. Some teams that I think will get worse. But you're going to have a full plate. Obviously, the Eagles play the Ravens on Saturday. A couple games on Sunday as well. You know, I mentioned to you, oh, real quick. So I watched C.J. Stroud last night. And do I think Bryce Young and Anthony Richardson and some of the younger quarterbacks are going to struggle in their first exhibition game? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would make this point to you, though. C.J. Stroud, please tell me why I think a quarterback from Ohio State, that player is going to change the narrative of that program never in a million years in the history of 160 years of football that Ohio State has been playing has never produced a all-pro quarterback in the NFL. Why, what, what makes me sit here and think Ohio State and C.J. Stroud is going to change that narrative? Justin Fields is struggling. When Dwayne Haskins was alive, he struggled. I mean, go down the list of any quarterback that has come out of that school. Krenzel, the kid who won the national title, I guess. Mike Tomzak, I guess. But those are marginal quarterbacks. Ohio State does not produce superstar quarterbacks. That's not a position that players around the country are running to. Quarterbacks don't go to Ohio State. The best quarter, you, there's a reason you don't see any of, any of them in the NFL. They don't go there. Why? Because they don't develop them. They never have. Go back to Woody Hayes. They've never developed quarterbacks at that school. They never have. It's not an important position for them. They beat you with O-line, D-line, linebackers, running backs, wide receivers. The wide receivers at Ohio State are by far more gifted. The receivers at Ohio State make the quarterbacks. They make them success successful. And... You're playing against shitty corners in the Big Ten. There's a reason when you watch these quarterbacks in college play at Ohio State and you go, unbelievable talent. Cardell Jones, all these guys, they're bums. Those windows aren't as wide open in the NFL as they are at the Big Ten level. Just saying, I mean, look, I hope the kid changes the narrative. He would be the first one in 160 years of football at Ohio State. No quarterback has ever come out of Columbus. And the one guy they had, here's the prime example of them not being able to identify good quarterbacks at Ohio State. You ready? They couldn't even identify Joe Burrow. They let him walk out the building and go somewhere else. Dude. Oh, so, so JM goes, so what? Michigan produced one great quarterback. That's not the point I'm making. Why in the world? And by the way, the quarterback that he said that Michigan produced is the one guy everyone in Ann Arbor hated. He got the job by default. They wanted Drew Henson and Brian Greasy and all these other guys to have the job. They didn't want Brady to have the job. Lloyd Carr hated him. Hated him. Okay, shit, by default. Won 12 games, an Orange Bowl, I think. 
It's funny. Michigan fell into Brady the same way New England fell into Brady. Again, he keeps Jam go sell. Why keep drafting him then? Why keep drafting a kid out of Ohio State? That's the point. That's the point. Why use a first rounder on any Ohio State quarterback when you know it's not going to work? Every single year, because Ohio State dominates the Big Ten, kid puts up great numbers, and you watch Stroud and you go, there's another guy that's not going to make it. Why draft a guy and use a first round pick on something you know is going to fail? It just shows you again, continuing to do stupid shit over and over and over and over and over again results in people still doing stupid shit. It was on display last night. You're like, why would people still to this day, why does the NFL not learn their lesson? And then you answer it this way. Jalen Hurts, a second rounder. Okay. Baker Mayfield, the number one overall pick. People can't get that position right. Very few times do you land on a franchise quarterback in the first round. Very few times. Carson Palmer wasn't a franchise quarterback. He was okay. Now, he's a USC guy. There's another school that doesn't produce quarterbacks. I'm under the belief that Caleb Williams is going to be that next guy. Yeah, okay. We'll see. Pac-12 or Pac-4, whatever it is now, Southern Cal's never produced a quarterback that's been worthy of anything in the NFL. Come on, man. Stupid. Stupid for programs. And I'm, I'm watching that last night going, why would you consistently throw a first-rounder at people like that when you know it will never work? Okay. They did play New England. Uh, by the way, D'Amico Ryans, you know, I tweeted this out last night at Dan Cilio show. Hey, they're playing harder. They have no talent on that team. And I'm going to make a prediction to you. You ready for this one? I think that kid Will Anderson is going to be a better football player than Michael Parsons. I think he's going to be a better football player. I think he's more athletic. I think he's bigger. I think he's tougher. I think he's going to get to the quarterback. He's got Ryan's helping him. You bet, baby. I see good things with Will Anderson. Will Anderson, in my opinion, will be better than Michael Parsons. He is a good-looking talent. Absolutely. Hey, Big Seals, the realest guy may not always agree, but you're Philly through and through. I can't wait to meet you at Hooters and have a beer. Thank you so much, Ace. I appreciate that, man. Yeah, I, I, I think Will Anderson, the kid out of Alabama, is going to be a better player than Michael Parsons. This kid's, this kid's got it. He, he's got the it. Okay? Jamie goes, Anderson was drafted higher. I don't care. He's going to be a better football player. Michael Parsons is going around telling people that he's better than Lawrence Taylor. Anderson will be better. Anderson will be better, okay? I like what I'm seeing with that kid. By the way, again, Michael Parsons, Will Anderson, um, Will Anderson has the same mentality as Devontae Smith and Jalen Hurts. Who do you want on your team? Same type of work ethic. Tell you one thing I like about that kid, just like I like what every Alabama guy that comes out of that program, let me play in the bowl game for my guys and let me finish something I started. I like guys like that. Those guys didn't have to play in that Sugar Bowl. They did anyway because they wanted to finish what they started. That's character. They had millions and millions of dollars on the line. They still did it. Good for them. Some go like this. Well, gee, you're, you're, you're congratulating a kid for doing something that he should do anyway. Not quite the case any longer today, is it? You get huge pats on the back for going to work. 
You get huge pats on the back because people like to be stroked. Everybody today likes to be stroked instead of just doing your job. Okay? LJ, I got so much to get to today, it's incredible. Philly Godfather, 530. We're going to talk with our friend. Um, I think the Eagles are going to have a little bit of a difficult time with the Patriots from what I saw last night. Man, they're so well coached. They're so well coached. Here's the problem, though, with New England. Do they have enough playmakers? Okay. Do they have enough guys? See, they're going to make plays on that Eagle defense. But I don't think they're going to make consistent plays enough to beat them. And that's going to be the end all for the Patriots and why they lose that game in week one. Um, I, I, w- I would say this to you. They just, they don't have enough in New England. Offensive skilled people. Now, Belichick is not going to show a lot. But what he does show is still his mentality. I saw something last night that I already know how he's going to attack the Eagle defense, which is pretty simple, too. It's not really any kind of mind-breaking news here. Um, he's here, here are the areas he's going to attack because you have zero experience there. He's going to run the ball on you. Okay? And that will be the key to their success if they win the game or not. If they get five yards of carry on your defense, they'll win the game. And they don't turn it over. If you can't stop the run, you have no experience really outside of Fletcher Cox at your defensive tackle position. I believe they're going to throw screens, and I believe they're going to test those linebackers, especially N'Kobe Dean. Zero experience at the linebacker position. Who your starter is at Mike. Little bit on Morrow. Question mark will be whether he makes the team or not. Whether he gets a guy from New England on the ground or not. Don't talk to me about an outside linebacker who's not even in the mix potentially to make the roster and telling me he's going to get an NFL running back down in week one of the season. When you got a conversation going on if Nicholas Morrow even makes the team so don't talk to me about that okay so to me I watched how they attacked the Houston Texans defense the Houston Texans defense is not that bad they just don't have any talent there yet Ryan's has them running around they were they played with energy it's just, again they just don't have talent but they're clearly going to attack our safeties They attacked the safeties with the Texans. So you kind of got a sense of what O'Brien's going to do because he doesn't have gigantic skilled people. He doesn't have superstar skilled people in New England. So what do you do? You're going to attack the inexperience and you're going to attack the weakness. The weakness of the Eagles is their defensive tackle position until further notice. And the weakest position on the entire Eagle team is the linebacking core. And then I would say the second weakest position on your team is your running back. Third would probably be safeties. So he's going to go linebacker safety, and he's going to threaten those. First and foremost, he's got to be third and short. They did a lot of that last night. Again, this is what you take away. Scoreboard's not an issue. It's why you're never going to hear me bring a score up in preseason football. But what you're going to hear me bring up is – you're going to hear me bring up um you're going to hear me bring up how they're attacking and what they're doing fundamentally and in my opinion again with the addition of Gonzalez remember something their edge rushers are outstanding their defensive line plays outstanding their linebacker core is good they're a little short in the secondary but still at the end of the day They were an outstanding unit last year, which is not surprising. That was a good unit. And let me say this to you. If that unit was in the NFC, they'd have been number one. They would have been number one. That team has to play the Bills, the Bengals, the Ravens. They have to play all these big-time offenses. 
playing the shitty offenses that you got in the NFC. Last year, the Eagles played shitty defenses and offenses. Well, not so much the defenses, but offenses last year. That def- And again, I just don't think they have enough playmakers on offense. Their running back is exceptional. Okay? The kid Stevenson is exceptional. Got to keep him healthy, I would think, if you're in New England in the exhibition season. Any guy that can get you 60 catches and 500 yards in receiving and 1,000 yards rushing and 4-7 a carry, that's a weapon. You're praying to God that DeAndre Swift is that guy. You're praying to God, okay, that that guy that you, you – there's not a guy on that Eagle team that could cover that running back. And just because you've never heard his name doesn't mean that he's not going to be effective against inexperience. And again, do you notice what I'm saying about the Eagles here? I'm not saying talent. I'm saying your lack of experience. You got an experienced guy who knows how to catch the ball, run with the ball. You have an, the greatest coach in the history of the National Football League, and they're going to threaten those areas. Now, you get great play. If you stop the run and you hold them, under four yards of carry, you'll beat the Patriots 31-7. If you don't, it'll be a fourth quarter football game. Okay? And it wouldn't shock me to see that a fourth quarter football game, just like Detroit last year. That Detroit game was a fourth quarter game. Weird shit happens in week one. I think Bill O'Brien, too. There's no question. I think Bill O'Brien is going to be an asset in New England. But again, I I don't want to blow up New England here, making New England sound like they have a ton of talent on that team. They don't. Their talent's on the defensive side, not the offensive side. So you're going to have to make that game a fourth quarter football game if you're New England. And if you're the Eagles, you want to score immediately. You want to go on 14 play drives, 12 play drives if you can. And if you can do that and run the ball against them, it's going to be a long night for them. But I saw what they were going to do. And I kind of get a sense of what they're going to do in game in game one against the Eagles. See, the first part of the season – is not going to be any really conversation about your offense. You have an A plus offense and a C minus, no, C defense right now. Will it get better? Yes. Yes. I think you have a C defense. They're coached very well. It matters tremendously. The Eagles got to be prepared and they cannot play with their food here on this. That's right. What, what, what's in front of you? It's right. Tone, take care of business. And you know what that is? Run the ball on them. See how... The one great thing... That's right, Micah. You're, you're dead on, Micah. Eagles scored in their first two possessions, 14-0. I don't think they... I don't think New England could come back from that. Now, if you're hanging around and it's 14-7... And you go into halftime, 14-7, 17-10, it's going to be a fourth quarter ball game. Again, the kryptonite on the Eagles this year is nothing to do with their offense. Ah, You could question the running game and the running backs, but you're not going to, they're going to be able to cover that. Now, also this, do you really want Jalen Hurts running a lot in that week one? I guarantee you, you want me to, I'm going to make a prediction to you guys. Okay? JM says Stevenson's an average back. Well, then you have dog shit backs. A guy would, get this. See what guy like JM undermining a player of Stevenson's credentials? 60, this guy's Brian Westbrook. 1,000 yards rushing, 500 yards receiving, and 60 catches. He says socks. Really? You're hoping for that. You're hoping for that guy. 
I don't give a shit what this guy thinks at Stevenson. Because remember, I'm going to always apply what people say in here about other players. If you think that guy's not a good player, then you don't have a player. And that means DeAndre Swift is not better than him. He's never proven it in his entire career that he's been better than him. Where do you say that you have a better back than the kid in New England? Where? He's in Carolina now. You don't. You have wishful thinking. I have sample size. That's not an opinion. The kid's career last year and the kid, oh, Sills, that's one good year. I know, Jalen. I know, Jalen. We're going to apply all your dumb shit to everyone to be fair here. Okay? Just because you, that's right. That's exactly what it is. It's name recognition. Just because you don't know the name doesn't mean New England's running game is trash. He's a productive and he's very effective in that system. Fans better not sleep on him. I'm telling you, man. That's why when you watch what New England does, see, the Ravens, are, what's that, what's, what do the Ravens have? They got like a 23-game win streak or something or 23. And, New England doesn't give a shit about that stuff. They work on things that are their weaknesses. They're working on weaknesses. That's what I think the exhibition season's all about. Okay? So, that game's going to be a little bit more interesting than what people think. Do I think the Eagles come away with that win? I do, because I don't think New England has enough offense. But if you can't stop the run, you'll lose that game. You will lose that game. Your defense is not that good. Yet. Yet. Now, if all of a sudden we see Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter stopping the run, that means they're ahead of schedule. This is not anything to do with ability. I have not said the word, they suck. I said the words, inexperienced. That's it. That's it. So, 99.9% of the people that watch our show are very intelligent football people. There's a few percent people that just think and demise and undermine other people's talents on other teams. Because they really, you know, they look at their their guys in a better light, which is cool. It's okay. Your team is not better coached than New England. New England just doesn't have the talent. You hired a guy that won three Super Bowls up there. As a consultant to your football team. So if Bill Belichick is not the coach you think he is, why did you hire Matt Patricia, one of his understudies, as a consultant to your team so you could have a better coaching staff? Did you ever think of that? So before you say you think your team's better coached, you took a coach off of his coaching staff and put him on yours so that you can get a better sense of how to prepare against other teams. Well, if Belichick and you think he sucks so bad, you put a guy from his staff on your team. Okay? The Eagle defense will be the reason they don't win the Super Bowl this year if this thing doesn't mature quick enough. And by the way, do I think they'll be in a position to be better by week eight, depending on what health looks like? And I'm, hey, this is clearly an opinion I'm making. I don't think you have a Mike linebacker on that team. I, I, I just do not think you, and by the way, I'm going to start doing this. I'm going to name the position now because I don't give a shit what N'Kobe Dean's name is. His name means nothing to me. It's like, it's, it's like the guy from uh, Bull Durham, Luke Lanouche. He's me. I don't give a shit what his name is. You don't have a Mike linebacker right now. Now, if you want to move Miles Jack over and N'Kobe over to the Will or Sam, I'm good with that. I think that makes more sense. 
Okay? However, right now you don't have a mic. And you really don't have a free safety. You got a strong safety, maybe. You don't have a free safety. So we'll see. And that's what I took away from New England. Funny, a guy was tweeting me, he goes, you must be watching a different game than I am. Yeah, we completely am. I totally watch a different game. You're talking to me about scoreboard. Who gives a shit about a scoreboard in an exhibition football game? New England had a top 10 defense. Eagle fans better wake up. In week one, anyone could get caught. We almost got caught in Detroit last year. New England had a top 10 defense. You don't. You don't have a top 10 defense. You may in three years or two years. What happens if you don't get 50 sacks this year? If you don't get 50 sacks, they'll bench Slay. What do you think the over-under is that Slay has an injury or gets benched by week eight? Good or bad? Because if he continues the way he played the last two months of the season, you got to make a tough decision on that. We have a top three offense. Actually, I would make this point to you. I think you have a top, maybe the best offense in the NFL, talent-wise. Does anybody? Here, I, I, I would say this. You have a top three offense, Robert? Is there a better football team in the NFL right now offensively and talent alone? Then the Kansas City Chiefs don't have a better talented uh, roster in offense than you. The Bills don't. The Bengals are kind of there, but their old line's not near yours. Name me an offense. Chargers, maybe? Maybe the Chargers? Name me another offense in the NFL that is as complete of an offense as the e I think the Eagles have the best offensive talent in the NFL. O-line, receivers, tight end, quarterback, all of it. Running back, you hope Swift is good. All you need is a good back, and the rest of it fits in. I don't think the Ravens, I think the Ravens have the third best O-line in the NFL. You really trust Odell Beckham to be healthy? So you're going to trust a guy who's missed two years of football in Odell Beckham and Zay Flowers, who you just drafted from BC. The tight end's good. The O-line's good. The quarterback, who's the running game? He is the running game. Ravens are a good, that looks like a good group. Better than the Eagles? I don't think so. I don't think they're better offense. I think the Philadelphia Eagles have the best offense in the NFL when it comes to talent. Now, when you start talking about coaching and quarterback play, they got Kansas City does more with less because they have that quarterback. They, Jalen Hurts would be lucky to win seven games in Kansas City. Justin Herbert would be lucky to win seven games in Kansas City. Okay? I think the only other guy that could go into Kansas City and win would be Josh Allen because he's got one wide out. That's it. There's no running game in New Buffalo. There's no other wide out. It's one guy. It's one guy. That's why when we looked at it yesterday, when you're talking... 49ers have great offensive weapons, except the quarterback. I don't know who's going to get all those weapons the ball yet. Jets don't have a line. Their tackles are atrocious. Joseph, they got into an inner scrimmage game against Carolina and got their heads kicked in. They had Rodgers, in my opinion, in that controlled scrimmage, from what I'm being told, he would have been sacked five or six times. Brian Burns was in the backfield the entire afternoon in a controlled scrimmage when they were going against Carolina the other day. Okay? Jalen Hurts elevates 
average running backs because of his exceptional ability as a dual threat. So you think Jalen Hurts helps the running back position more than the O-line? When you arguably have four of the best five O-linemen in the game and the richest and most expensive, the Eagles have the most expensive offensive line in football. And you think that's Hurts? I do think his versatility helps a ton of that. But don't underestimate the fact that you have spent almost your entire salary cap at that position. Two tackles combined are $45 million, and your center's 15. Your left guard's going to be a $20 million a year guy. Don't underestimate the money that they spend in that. Okay? Okay? CZ goes at Stoutland. It is, but it's also the money they spend. There is not another position group, maybe outside of your corners, that you spend more money at than your O line. Your corners are 30 million, your O line's 60 million. Okay? Trenches are where it counts. I do, hey, to, to go back to your point, I do think Jalen helps running backs a lot. Like, a, a, a drop-back quarterback's not going to help DeAndre Swift. Because, get this, unless you put a spy on Jalen, he's the only guy that's going to be able to roam free out there. Okay? Sills, they were all drafted, though, so it's literally stoutly getting them paid. Fair enough. That's insane. Every single starting offensive lineman on the Eagles was drafted by the Eagles. Can you tell me another team that has done that and the best unit in the game is unbelievable? Even your backups are drafted by your team. You do not miss an O-lineman. In, look. The Andre, here, look at this. Okay, so Andre Dillard became a millionaire in Tennessee. Isaac Sayamala was drafted. He went to Pittsburgh. Those are financial decisions. Those aren't failures. Maybe Dillard is a failure, but he was uncompromising too. He didn't want to play multiple positions. You want to hear something crazy? Here's what's really sad about Andre Dillard. Andre Dillard might be the starting right guard right now in position to make $25 million if he had stayed and been willing to go over to right guard. Because look what Landon Dickerson was. He was earmarked to be a center. He's going to be making $20 million. So that guy, him not having flexibility, may have cost him a starting job in the NFL for the next 10 years. And $20 million a year. Landon Dickerson, moving over to left guard, is now making him one of the elite players at his position. And he wasn't even earmarked for that. He was brought into Philly to take over for Jason Kelsey. Sometimes, man, you got to kind of see the future a little bit here. Okay? You got to kind of see the future a bit. All right, we'll get into a little bit here. I want to wait for that topic because we kind of have gone through it numerous times. So I'm going to wait for that one. And this is where I'm going here for what I want to see on Saturday. We do this every Friday and we kind of give you a preview. And I kind of talked to you just now about how I watch a game. Please do me a favor. Don't care about the scoreboard. Nobody cares. Preseason scores don't matter. Don't care about them. You'll never hear me bring up a score. Okay, I don't care. I I, I really don't care. But what you do is you want to see certain things being attempted. Okay? 
It's really going to come down to what personnel they put out there on the field too. See, let's let's go defensively because that's the biggest question mark. Who should start the game? Do I need to see Brandon Graham? No. Do I need to see Hassan Reddick? No. If the Kobe Dean is not in the game, I don't want to see any of those guys. Because the number one thing that, here's the problem though. The number one thing that you have to work on the most right now is communication. Because there's so many new faces in the huddle. And there's a new signal caller, but he's not going to be out there. So you're going to be kind of out there with no experience and no communication skills. So if you don't play your front line guys, that thing's going to be a train wreck against the Ravens. Mark my words. It'll be a train wreck. Who, if the Dean's not out there, you're putting Jack at the mic. Okay. For it to look decent on Saturday, I would want to see this. Get Nolan Smith's butt out there. Okay. I want to see how you need to play him and how, where he's going to fit in. Do I need to see Josh Sweat? I need some experience in the huddle. I don't need to see Fletcher. I do need to see Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis play together because that's what I'm trying to strive to. I want to see a lot of Milton Williams in the rotation. And by the way, I would say this to you. If I was going to look at my rotation at DT, if I'm Tracy, Tracy Rocker, how I would rotate, I would start my guys' first two series. Then I would bring Milton in. And I would play Milton with Carter, get those two guys acclimated to playing against one another. Then I would start rotating after the third series, bringing Jordan back. Jordan needs reps. You know, I heard something today, and I respect D Gun a lot. But when I heard him say that Jordan Davis is a rotational guy, that's a flop. That's a flop. Going into your second year, and you're still talking about that, that's a flop. I need to play this kid. I need to see. Score doesn't matter here. I got to see him play. Okay? I got to see him play. He's got to get in there and play. I want to see him play three downs. By the way, I want to see him play at least six, seven, eight plays in a row. Get, get Zach Cunningham in there. Get this kid Christian Ellis in there. Okay? Safety. I want to see Sidney Brown running around out there. I want to see Keely Ringo. Do you play a little Keely Ringo at safety or strong safety? Do I put him back there? Do I move him around a little bit? Put him in a slot? I need to see Reed Blankenship play back there. You're not deep. By the way, do I want to see Bradbury or Slay? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You get hurt at one of those positions, your defense will be set back the entire year. For you to get home more than 50 sacks, why do you think you had such a great season last year up front getting to the quarterback? Because your safety play at the beginning of the season was exceptional. You lose one of those corners, it's over defensively. I do not want to see. Okay? I do not want to see those corners at all in preseason ball. Controlled scrimmages, okay? You can stop the play. Guy gets banged up. I'm, I want to see those guys and those veteran guys like Fletcher and Brandon. I want to see those guys in the controlled environment. So guys aren't rolling up on one another. You get less roll-ups when you're in a controlled environment. Guys stop one another in the controlled environment, especially when you lack depth. The Eagles lack depth. I don't give a shit. Okay, so Peter King says you're deep on defense. Where? Where? Where are you deep on defense? Give me one position you're deep on defense. You have bodies, and once again, you're deep in potential. 
You're not deep in talent yet. You're, you have no, you're not deep at DT. You got one guy who had an underachieving year and another guy who's never played a down. You got Fletcher Cox and Milton Williams. And the other guy hasn't played a snap. How are you deep? Once again, that's wishful thinking. That's not deep. Those are your frontline guys. Jesus Christ, many. It's like talking to stupid asses here. You think you're deep if you don't have anyone who's ever played an NFL snap. Seriously. You think you're deep if you've never played a snap. Or you've had 34 of them. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> So they need to rotate a lot of players in. Yeah, we're just going to we're we're going to slide by that because many of you don't know what you're talking about right now. I'm here hooking you up here. What is needed to be seen, not this dumb stuff that you think you have like gangrene here now. So we're going to do this. Um a lot of rotation, I would say. A lot of rotation on defense. Linebacking core is uh, is going to be questionable. By the way, that kid Snoop Hudley, I want to see how they defend him. He's going to get the majority of the snaps. He's a good ball player. Tony, you know what I'm talking about? That kid Snoop Hudley, he can play. I like him. And I think he fits that system in Baltimore really well. He can play, man. How about this? That Snoop Hunley kid, man. Did, did, did the Ravens did, did the Ravens make the playoffs last year? Didn't they have the Bengals on the goal line? Didn't they almost beat the Bengals last year? Was that last year they did that? Didn't, didn't they push the Bengals almost to, like, uh, a loss in the playoffs last year? Right? That kid Snoop almost beat the Bengals. He's a good football player. How can backups prove their worth if starters are healthy in front of them throughout the season? How do they convince you that they are deep, for example, um, at cornerback, it's a great question, Tom, because today you don't get the practice time, nor do you get the reps to do that any longer. And you don't have three months of three a days or two a days any longer to earn a spot on the team. You're doing this all by, you're, you're just doing this all by guesswork because there's not a lot of reps now to be passed out. Now, to me, I think you got to make the team and you got to show who you are in the preseason. St th these Eagle starters are not going to play. So, Every opportunity you get, if you get 10 snaps or you get 25 snaps, you got to go out there and you got to show that you're going to be able to be counted on if somebody goes down. Or, because look what the Eagles have done already. The Eagles saw that they had no depth, and after Dean got hurt, what'd they do? They signed two linebackers immediately. Because they didn't let... It wasn't just because Dean got hurt. It was also because of the shit they were seeing on film. Christian Ellis is not playing well. Because if Christian Ellis is playing well, why are you signing two linebackers? That's all for the medium. That's all for the fans. They don't trust them. Or they wouldn't. Or they wouldn't have signed two. I get one. Two. Tells you they need more depth and they don't like what they see on film. There's a reason people bring players in. I'll give you a rule here. When you're a good football team, and I'll give you, I'll give you a great example of this. Um, when Jimmy Johnson first took over the Dallas Cowboys, and they were 1-15, in 15, every Tuesday, that's player's day off, that's when free agents used to come into Valley Ranch. And he'd put 20 guys there. 20 guys would roll in on Tuesday. Cowboys got a little better the next year. That number got cut in half. 
All of a sudden, they win a Super Bowl in year three. Do you know how many guys he brought in? The first year he brought in 20 on Tuesdays to look at talent because he was looking for talent. In year three, when they won the Super Bowl under Jimmy, do you know how many guys he was bringing in on Tuesdays? One, two, sometimes none. Because he's trying to replace not the top end of the roster, but the bottom 5% of the roster every day. You're only as strong as the weakest guy on your roster, not the top end guys. Because you don't win in the NFL unless you have a roster. That's what the Eagles and how they won last year. They won because they were deep and good. You're not afforded. That roster that you had last year is arguably one of the best rosters I've ever seen. And they come along every 10 years. They come along like that when everything's lined up well. Free agents pan out, draft choices. Shit, you didn't even need to play your draft choices last year. Because all the free agents panned out. But the difference with those free agents, you gave them sinus bonus money. These were guys you wanted. You're bringing in guys because you have to now. Okay? I mean, you're not signing Zach Cunningham because you want to. You're not signing Miles Jack because you want to. You're signing them because you have to. They don't like what they're seeing on film. That's my takeaway. Okay? We weren't particularly deep last year, especially at linebacker. So when when someone says that, or DB, you weren't deep last year when you had all those players and you had a guy with 120 tackles, another guy with 160 tackles. You had N'Kobe Dean behind him. And he was the depth on your team, okay? Your defensive tackle position was exceptionally deep. You had Epps back there with 91 tackles. You had another guy lead the NFL in interceptions. And you had all the players that are going to be expected to play this year as backups. Okay? Let's go over to the offensive side now. How do I want to see that offense look? Got to put Mariota's ass in there. I do not want to see Jalen Hurts only in the controlled environment. So I don't have any kind of issues. I don't want anything. You know, I don't need a mistake or an accident or a guy pushing him out of bounds. He hurts a shoulder. I don't need any of that. I can't have that right now. And nor do I want that. Nor do I. What's the point? To get him reps, practice harder. Practice longer. I'm not putting Jalen Hurts in a football setting in a game that doesn't matter. If Jalen Hurts blows his shoulder out or his knee, it's going to be in the New England game. It's not going to be in a Raven week one exhibition football game. That's not happening. That's not happening. I'm not doing any of that. If I've got Bailey Zappi or Mac Jones, I'm playing both those stiffs in my opener in preseason. If I've got Jalen Hurts or Mahomes or any of these guys, I'm not doing anything like that. Okay? I mean, to me, I mean, should Baltimore play Lamar Jackson? Why? Beckham's not going to play because he missed some football last year. You might, I don't know. But boy, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want him running around out there. I just wouldn't want him running around. So on the offensive side, I would make this point to you. I would say this, okay? Do I get Malata some snaps? Man, Malata and Lane, do I risk putting Malata and Lane, my two bookend tackles, in a preseason football game. See, this is not coaching scared. This is preventative. How important is playing Lane Johnson and Jordan Malata versus Baltimore? I don't know. Do I put Jack Driscoll out there 
at right tackle? Or do I put Steen at right tackle and Jurgens at right guard? Jurgens and Steen have to play. But who's going to be this? Do I put Jurgens in at center too and give him reps at center? Probably. Give Jurgens some reps at center and right guard. Let him start the right guard, move him over to center, put Steen in. Probably what your rotation is going to be. Okay? I want to get Josh Sills some work. I want to put Sills out there, maybe at right tackle. I might start Driscoll at left or Driscoll at right tackle, Sills at left tackle, Jurgens at right guard first. Um, get Kelly, that kid you had who was in Indianapolis, put him at guard. And then just start, I, I, I'm not playing. Do I, maybe, do I get Landon some snaps? Maybe, maybe, but iffy. Dude, I don't want to be, hey, if I'm going to give Jordan a lot and Lane Johnson, I'm not giving Lane any reps. Maybe Jordan, I give him a series. Kelsey doesn't play at all. Cam Jurgens is going to play a lot. I, I, I want him at center and right guard. And Steen's going to play a lot. Maybe right tackle. Because he's going to be the heir apparent to that position. I think he will be the heir apparent to that position. So I would pl- I would want to see him at right tackle. Steen at left guard. Steen could maybe even start at right tackle. Jurgens at left guard. And then Jurgens goes to center. Steen goes in the right guard. Because what that does, what does that do? What that does, it creates depth. In case Kelsey goes down, you've got reps for Cam Jurgens. And if Lane goes down, which he did a year ago, you have reps for Steen at right tackle. And what you're doing in the process is you're creating depth in case of injury all through the lineup. And you're creating the versatility that you're looking for. So to me, that makes more sense. Because if you think you're pigeonholed right now, and Jason Kelsey's 36 years old, there's a good chance he may miss some time. So I would want to get some snaps for him. Because he's the heir apparent anyway. Okay? So to me, plus those guys need reps. And again, at the end of the day, what people don't want to do is they don't want to. So you're going to play a guy, Cam Jurgens, at right guard in New England and have no reps for him at all in the exhibition season? Or Steen? And you think you're going to plug and play like you're going to do N'Kobe Dean. How idiotic some people think. You're trying to create depth in case of a disaster here. The NFL is one on war of attrition, not just on talent. If that was the case, you'd have won the Super Bowl. So that's the running back position now. Um, do you play Swift? See, I don't want to show too much against New England. I don't want to show too much for New England either. I don't want to do too much. I want to I want to look like a vanilla ice cream cone in this game. I don't want to throw too much into this game. I want to get some reps. I want everybody to get in. I want to get game tempo going. And I don't want to give New England any kind of heads up of what we're doing here. Okay? Because what you don't want to do is start to put shit on film that you've been working on in camp so that they can prepare for it. Remember, Belichick's looking for any angle. Oh, they're working on middle screens. They're, they're, they're working on wheel routes. This kid Gainwell comes in on third and six. They keep Penny in on short yardage. You start to get tendencies and trends. Just in mentality. 
you start to see how players are being used and you don't want to tip your hat. That's one thing that Jonathan Gannon started doing a little too much at the end of last year was the fact that they were tipping their hand. They started getting it and they started seeing what they were doing defensively. And that's why he tried to do those passing pass off routes, passing the receiver off in the Super Bowl. They got confused. So what did Reed do? He ran crossing routes. Okay. Do I want to see AJ and Devante? No, but I do want to see a ton of Quez Watkins and the kid from Atlanta. You got to get those guys reps. You got to find out if you have a backup tight end too. I mean, who's the, who's the backup tight end? Is there a guy that have any quality? You might have to go into the market and find somebody. Okay? Hollywood goes Ravens play hard. Um, <clears throat> they, they take preseason football very serious in Baltimore. Okay? They really do. They take, they take, they take preseason football because, you know, what does John Harbaugh do? And what is the most important thing that John Harbaugh does each and every single year? John Harbaugh uses what, – what do you guys think John Harbaugh uses preseason football and why they're so good in preseason football? He loves to practice game tempo. I can't tell you how many times I have shown up to certain camps – and teams just don't practice it. They lollygag the drills. They don't. They, they don't have a high energy. Okay? They don't practice game tempo. You know when you're around a great coach, everything is done game speed. Running to drills. Running, running to team activity. Everything you do is game tempo. And some organizations practice that all the time. So that's why they're always prepared when the season starts. You never see a Ravens team, unless they're hurt, limp out of the gate. So, again, I'm playing a ton of depth on both sides, and I got to get some of the new guys. And, and, And for the record, I might even do... One of the most important things to prepare for New England and start to put some, how about this? How about some false intel on the screen? Some fake news. Some plays you never run. Some plays you'll never run during the year. Let them game plan it. Let them see it on film. Because I guarantee you, I guarantee you this. uh, New New England is going to take that game versus Baltimore and they're going to dissect it and they're going to they're going to look at the shit that you guys worked on okay and the things you were working on in that game and apply it to the starters you start seeing some of the things and all of a sudden the next week in the next exhibition game you guys are doing the same shit they're going to see a trend this is a league of trends again this is how every single coach I've ever been around this is Every single coordinator I've ever been around, this is how they prepare for a team like like the Eagles. This is how every team will prepare against New England or against the Eagles, especially New England. They'll take the Super Bowl and they will take the last four games of games that mattered prior to Hurts being hurt. And those four games, they'll look at trends on what they were doing. They'll look at the Super Bowl and they'll go from there and they'll look at what they like to do and what Jalen's comfortable doing. Then what they'll do is they'll put the top 20 plays on a book, little binder. This is what they like to do. These are their 20 favorite plays. Then what they'll do is they'll do it at a formation. Right, Hash? They like to do this into the boundary. Then they'll run about they'll list about five plays that they like to run into the boundary or run to wide side. Then they'll do another one. There'll be another page 
middle of the field. Hertz will do this. That's how they dissect it. And you'll get that book on Wednesday. And you'll look at that game plan and you'll start to look at, okay, so they like to do this. And here's their 20 favorite plays. 20 favorite plays. You go down and you watch it on film. And then you watch technique. What technique? Maybe what twists? What stunts? What run stunts? Can't have a bad fit here because Hertz is the, in the RPO. He's really good at it. So you'll start watching game film because the quarterly control guy will break down those films and you'll be looking at their favorite top 20 plays. And you'll study that shit until it's until you're nauseated. And so you're looking at what they do. Now, if you start adding new wrinkles in and you want to start doing something new, you don't want to show that against the Ravens. <laughs> you just don't, man. All right. Hour number two coming up here, folks. Hey, I can't wait until I see many of you at Hooters, and we're going to have such a great time at Hooters and King of Prussia, man. I mean, everybody has been talking to me about it. Last night, it was absolutely packed. People were crazy last night for preseason football because it's football, right? And at the end of the day, this is going to be your official home for all Eagle fans. And by the way, all seven locations, northeasthooters.com. Find the nearest one nearest you, and you'll be able to go and enjoy all the great Hooters foods and that location nearest you. 40 years. This is the 40th anniversary that Hooters is celebrating. Make no I – mean, make, make, let me say this. No excuses for you not to get there during this football season. 40th anniversary. Been involved with them pretty much the entire time. It's really great. Hooters is your preseason place, as I tell you all the time, when it comes to your draft parties, it comes to your exhibition football. The iconic Hooters girls are going to be there to serve you Tuesdays. You buy 10 wings, you get 10 free. You're going to love it. Wing Wednesdays, right? This is another 40th year anniversary classic. They're all you can eat for 1983. Happy hours. Every day, each and every single day, get six items. Tried the fried pickles. You're going to love them for six bucks. We're going to be doing so many events. Also, at the Hooters and King of Prussia, you're going to love it. Do me a favor, though, for the location nearest you, go to, go to northeasthooters.com. There's a location near you somewhere in the Northeast. So go to nor northeasthooters.com and do me a favor. Tell them Big Sale sent you.